everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you're calling from. My name is Tina Hu. I'm the full-time MBA manager, recruitment admissions at UBC Solder School of Business. Thanks for joining us today for a lecture with Justin Ball. So in order to pass your chat box, we want you to type in the country and city you're calling in from just to you know, test out to if the chat, chat box works for you. Um, and uh, let's start the session today. I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is no ancestral and ceded territory of the Mexican people. I would like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So with the agenda today, we, I will do an uh, introduction of Justin and um, myself and my colleagues for joining us today. Uh, and then we will start the sample lecture. Um, after the sample lecture, there will be Q&A session with Justin. After the Q&A, which we finish our session today, um, Wei Yan, which is our IMBA manager, and I will have our own Ask Me Anything session right after the sample lecture. So with us here today is our um, lecture entrepreneurship and innovation group at UBC Solder School of Business, uh, Justin Ball. And in the room leading the session today, in addition to myself, and some of you probably have already met me through the MBA tools and group chats and one-on-ones. Um, so to those of you, thank you for your time and your interest in the MBA program. Um, and thank you all for joining us here. For those of you who I have not had a pleasure connecting yet, I'm Tina Hu, Puta Manager, uh, MBA Manager, Recruitment Missions at UBC Solar School Pieces. Uh, so I oversee the full time MBA program. I'm joined here today with my colleagues, Ashley Balkan, who oversees our professional MBA program, um, Wei Yan Chen, who leads the MBA program with the Shanghai Delta University. Also in this room, I have my colleagues, Tamara Shitnova and Carolyn Wong. They will be able to answer questions and facilitate the, the, the entire session today with me. Oh, sorry, moved too fast. So I'll pass the floor to Justin now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Tina, that for, for the kind introduction and, and welcome everybody. So wonderful to see folks connecting uh, from all over the world. Uh, really a, a beautiful time to connect. So uh, my name is Justin. Uh, yeah, I am entrepreneurship and innovation, but my thing is, is sustainability. I just can't help myself. I, I, I lead up the sustainability and ethics group at the Sauter School of Business. I teach sustainability and ethics to our MBA students. And so I hope that in the future, maybe we have an opportunity to, to, to work together. Now, I want to put sustainability in context because it's a word that, that has almost a uh, exponential increase in how often people say sustainability. It's sustainability this, sustainability that. It's 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 a bit exhausting at times. And um, in order to put it in context, I want to talk about something else that's not exponential, uh, but is oftentimes framed as it is, and that is global population growth. And I know we're going to start big picture, and then we're going to narrow down. But oftentimes you will hear that the sustainability crisis is one of population that we simply have too many people, and that's just not true. Right. We are not in the midst of an exponential population crisis. We have not been in the midst of an exponential population crisis. Human population growth rates peaked in the 1960s at about 2%. And ever since, they have been steadily declining. Now, humans live for a long time. And so this phenomenon has a long tail. And so, yeah, we're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood to 9 to 10, maybe 11 billion people but at the end of this century. But we are, we are not sort of seeing this sort of runaway growth that we can't possibly constrain. Right. In fact, what we're seeing in a lot of countries is shrinking populations, right? Countries like uh, Canada, for example, are barely breeding at the replacement rate, right? Where, you know, if, if, if you don't account for immigration, the country would almost be shrinking. Countries like Japan, they're terrified of shrinking, more old people than young people. Even think of the Chinese perspective, you know, you go back 20 years, it was like, you can have one child. And then it was like, okay, well, maybe you can have two children. And now they're like, please have all the children. We need children because there are too many old people not enough young people, right, to keep the population afloat. So the idea that we're in a population crisis doesn't really sort of uh, uh, hold water with me. 
but these people have needs, right? So if that's an idea from human geography 101, here's an idea from human psychology 101, which is everybody's got some kind of need, right? They, they have a need uh, for physiological things to be met, They're, the need for health or, or food or sleep. And if, they, if those needs are met, then they'll go and, and find an opportunity to remove themselves from danger, right? And if, if they seek shelter of some kind, and once you are safe, then you want to belong to something. Right? And once you belong to something, you then want to be loved by folks. You want to have self-esteem, right? respect from your peers, from others. And then in, in the long run, you, you hope to be in a position of achieving self-actualization, right? this idea uh, that uh, you, know, you, you have some kind of deeper purpose. And so I suspect that folks who are considering a graduate education are those who are questioning that purpose or, or looking to further that purpose of life. And so you're at the top of Maslow's hierarchy right now. So I want you to consider this like a second constraint or important idea as we contextualize sustainability. So the first is population, the second is needs. The third is this notion of what we call donut economics. So this comes from an economist at the University of Oxford called Kate Raworth. And Kate came up with this idea that economic systems need to create a safe and just space for humanity. Right. That systems need to provide a social foundation, they need to offer energy, and food, and water, and health, and shelter, but they need to meet those needs within a certain set of constraints. And those constraints, in this instance, is an ecological ceiling. Right? And we can recognize this as, like, let's say, the climate and its ability to endure all of the abuse that we throw it on a regular basis, or our, or our resources, both natural and non-renewable resources, like how many of those are we using on an annual basis? How much fresh water are we using on an annual basis? How much of the global landscape are we using to satisfy human needs instead of sort of maintaining and managing our sort of biosphere? And so Raworth said, look, business, in, in its definition of sustainability, should not just be sort of thinking about how do we become less bad, right? How do, we, how do we manage our downsides? But instead thinking, how are you contributing towards providing a social foundation where also recognizing there's an ecological ceiling? And so we could put sustainability in context by saying, look, it's adding these three ideas together. It's saying that, look, you're going to have about 10 billion people. They're going to have needs and you have to meet them within a certain set of constraints. And look, if you are having some wine, you're hanging out with some friends, it's after hours, you're at the bar, and you're having like a debate about sustainability, these are some great ideas to bring to the table. But if you're in the elevator with your CEO, and you want to talk to them about how to make sustainability more relevant to your organization, or the innovation opportunity sustainability represents, you don't start here. You don't start with Raworth, you don't start with Maslow, and you certainly don't start with 11 billion people by the end of this century. And this is one of the challenges with the topic of sustainability is that it is something conceptual, right? It's like justice or fairness, right? It doesn't have like a technical definition. It's not an equation, it's not math. Instead, it's just like a, it's a broad ethical concept that things should be better in the future than they are today, right? And that we're driving towards that, you know, better future one step at a time. And so, a gentleman called Seeger did some research looking at a spectrum of sustainability, and he came to this conclusion that sustainability can mean very different things in different contexts. He begins examining ecology, like the natural world, and he uses like the example of like a mouse. And look, if a mouse makes it through the night, that's in some regards sustainable. It survived the predation of that hawk. It survived. And so making it through the night, that static sustainability was great for that mouse, but a population of mice. They can't just make it through the nice, they have to reproduce. They have to survive that predation of the owl or the hawk over a longer term. They have to survive all sorts of pressures of natural selection, right? And maintaining a steady state, a, a finite population of mice is a good thing. But then there's sort of dynamic sustainability, recognizing that, look, systems have to evolve, right? There's the reproduction of the mice, but there's also the response to shocks to the system. Right? recovering from an introduction of a virus or a fire in the barn they live or a new family of hawks moves into the neighborhood and eats half the babies, right? So they have to be more dynamic in their survival strategies. But in the long run, we do know that in nature, the most likely outcome for every single species is either extinction or mutation, 
right? 99% of all species that have ever existed are now extinct, right? That's an uncomfortable fact, but it's what the fossil record tells us. And yet, you know, you go and try and tell some kid who's struggling at school, who doesn't have enough food over the table, or they don't have a roof over their head, that, well, you know, extinction is sustainable. It's the only thing that's inevitable for you, right? Good luck with that as a moral argument. And so we have to put sustainability in context. So Seeger looks at industry for inspiration and a law enforcement officer might look at, you know, the murder rate and says, hey, guess what, guys? The murder rate this year is the same as last year. That was sustainable. Okay, fine. But let's say you work at a factory and your job is to ensure that the widgets produced at that factory always come out looking the same, feeling the same, right? Operating and performing the same. Maintaining that steady state in, in your context is sustainable. But sometimes you have to think about dynamic sustainability. Let's say you're the supply chain manager of that factory. And your job is to engage in like strategic planning, disaster or crisis response. Let's say the inputs to the factory chain. There's a, there's a shortage of a particular material. There's a shortage of energy. There's a shortage of, of labor. You're responsible for sort of dealing with that dynamic environment. But the CEO of this organization is responsible for episodic sustainability. They have to figure out, are we making the right widgets? Are we in the right business? Is our strategy even sound? And so they have a definition of sustainability, which requires them to either mutate or go extinct. And so in English, we have a phrase. It says, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? And you may have encountered this in your life. You may not have. It's a, it's a, it's a strange one. It comes back from sort of the Middle Ages when uh, monks who, who you know, would spend their entire life just copying out by hand a single book and spend a lot of time in the afternoons getting drunk and debating things. You know, life was a different, it was a different time. Things unfolded at a different pace. And one of the sort of skills that you could demonstrate as a, as a thinker was your ability to argue about how many angels God would allow to fit on the head of a pin. Was it a thousand angels? Was it a million angels? Was it some infinite number of angels? And your ability to sort of marshal an argument and command the rhetoric was seen as something representative of, of, of your intellect. And oftentimes in sustainability, it feels like arguments are similar to counting angels on the head of a pin, right? They're interesting philosophical questions, but they don't solve problems. And so in 1987, the Brundtland Commission came along, UN Commission on Sustainable Development, and it, it gave us this very nice, precise, and tidy definition that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising on the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Right? That's nice. I can work with that, right? I work with that. And you can see here ideas from Raworth introduced, right? You, you, know, you see the social foundation meeting the needs of the present. You see the ecological ceiling meeting the needs of the future. You see that, that population trend, that dynamic we talked about introduced here, because you look at like, look, I have to think big picture. I have to think about all of these people. And you also recognize that Maslow is saying, hey, they have needs. You can't have a definition of sustainability, which just says to billions of people, too bad, you have to stay poor because we can't afford you to have you know, more ambitions for your life. It's not an operational definition, right? So tidy definitions can be attractive, but sometimes we have tidy definitions, which, which put us in a very difficult position. I want to offer you a tidy definition of business that comes from an economist named Milton Friedman. So Mr. Friedman posited that there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud, right? A simpler way of saying this would be the business of business is business. It's not business's responsibility to worry about climate change. It's not business's responsibility to worry about equity or diversity or inclusion. It's not business's responsibility to worry about geopolitical conflict. Responsibility of business is to make money. And for a long time, this definition was the dominant one. It captured people's attention. It provided a certain clarity to managers and leaders and shareholders saying, look, I will invest in businesses that make me as much money as possible. Consequences, whatever, I wanna make money. But like any idea, it, 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 it has been challenged over time. 
right? Because the part that gets forgotten in Friedman's definition is this idea that business has to stay within the rules of the game. And since this definition was first articulated in the 1970s, the rules of the game have changed substantially. The global economy is not what it was. The degree of interconnection, globalization, movement of financial capital, human services, ideas around the world, absolutely unprecedented. And so oftentimes now, businesses are quite effective at writing the rules of the game. The very you know, organizations that meant to constrain the behavior of business have been captured by business. And so we cannot rely on the pure self-interest of managers anymore if we're trying to think about sustainability over the long run. So there are companies that are trying to change the paradigm a little bit. And I'm gonna go, go out on a limb here and uh, use Amazon as an example. So you might have a strong opinion about Amazon one way or another, right? wonderful company, this, the convenience, the service, et cetera, et cetera, the genius of Bezos. Or you might say that Amazon feeds a consumerist mindset of people just buying things because it's convenient, not because they need them. Set that aside for a moment. Let's remember the early 2010s. It was a simpler time. There was no voice assistance. Mobile phones were kind of basic. E-commerce wasn't quite as popular as it is today. So one of the things that Amazon wanted to do to encourage more people to use their platform was they created these little buttons. And these buttons could be magnetic and they would go on your fridge or your dishwasher. And when you ran out of diapers or power bars or a coffee, you could hit that button and it would automatically add it to your cart. And the next time you wanted more goods, uh, that, that coffee or those diapers or those power bars would be there for you. Right, so you you had this this function of you know uh, you know being able to consume on demand, easy enough idea to understand. But on a more fundamental level, there's something very interesting about Amazon. They spend most of their time making the stuff people want, and a lot less time making people want their stuff. So, think about it this way: Does Amazon care if you drink coconut water or Coca Cola? No, they don't. They just want you to buy your drinks from them. Does Amazon care if you buy like seventh generation organic natural detergent or Tide? They don't care. Right? They just want to sell you whatever it is that makes you happy. They don't spend 25% of their budget just reminding you they exist. Like think about poor Coca-Cola, right? If Coca-Cola was a person, they would be one of the most desperately insecure people you have ever met. The amount of time that they spend reminding you they exist. It's like, oh, it's Christmas. Think of Coca-Cola. It's the summer. Think of Coca-Cola. It's an F1 race. Please think about Coca-Cola. Look at all these athletes and beautiful people and advertisements. And all this attention we're putting to remind you we exist. Why do they have to do that? Because their product is so inessential. A sugary drink that's bad for you. And so they have to do a lot to remind you we exist. Companies like Amazon are realizing, hey, we just let's just make the stuff that people want and, and meet their needs on a more fundamental level. So I want to offer you an example of a company that took this idea to a really interesting logical extreme, Philips. Right? So Philips is an is a Anglo-Dutch and, and sort of electrical engineering conglomerate. They make like razors and, and light fixtures and toothbrushes and light bulbs. And so Philips used to have an industrial lighting division. Right. And this division would, you know, go to an institution like UBC and they would say to UBC, hey, how many light bulbs can we sell you this year? Right. Can we sell you a thousand light bulbs? Maybe 10,000 light bulbs. Maybe Tina is working for Philips and she's particularly charismatic and she convinces UBC to buy a million light bulbs, even though Philip UBC has no need for a million light bulbs. Tina hits her sales target. She is fan, she is gets a, an award and a gold watch, and she is seen as a leader in that organization. And UBC is left with all these light bulbs it doesn't need. Right? That was her incentive in that world of selling light bulbs was just to maximize sales because she was just going to maximize shareholder profits. But Philip stopped selling light bulbs. Right? You can no longer go to Philip's industrial lighting division and buy a light bulb. All you can do is buy the service of light. So Tina no longer has to be charismatic business development manager. She has to be a designer and an engineer. She walks through the, the buildings and the hallways of UBC and says, how many lights are required? Where do they need to be? Right? How, how should this be structured? 
And it creates this entirely different incentive set for, for, for Tina because she's responsible for installing the light bulbs, identifying where they should be, when they should be on, when they could be turned off. She's responsible for maintaining the light fixtures. She's even responsible for paying for the electricity bill. All that UBC gets is the service of light. And so now compared to selling light bulbs, Tina maximizes her value to the organization in a totally different way, right? Yes, super Tina indeed, right? So what I'm curious about is what kind of new incentives does this business model introduce for Philips? And, and how could these be more sustainable? So who's feeling brave? Who's feeling brave and either wants to throw their, th throw their hand up or, or possibly put their ideas in chat? Like what kind of incentives does this business model introduce, right? Where instead of selling light bulbs, I sell the service of light. Yvonne is correctly identifying uh, how to save money, how to save energy, pardon me. Nazil is saying, hey, this is like a systematic approach. Jasmine's identifying this allows you to associate your brand more broadly than being pigeonholed into a single product. Um, yeah, do, set, the systems designing, people sensitive lighting, a service offering in addition to a product, says Michael. Uh, Kareem, you've unmuted. Uh, what, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, Justin. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for, for having us. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, this can uh, be like an additional service, like consultations. Um, you can spin it in any way, but uh, as long as you're offering value yeah. and getting uh, a fee. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Kareem. So, Kareem, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you for a second. Um, Kareem, what happens if 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 the light bulb uses less energy? What happens for Philips if it produces the same amount of light with less energy? What happens for Philips? They're going to be selling. Uh, so, so if ideally you'll have like subscription or where the, mm -hmm. the customers are coming back always the better the quality, which at some point light bulbs were, were infinite, uh, nobody would buy light bulbs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd assume business would decrease. Business would be good. But as, as, as Yvonne is, 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 is noting here, if the light bulb uses less energy, their operating costs go down. So the light bulb, the less energy it uses, the more money they make. The easier the light bulb is to install, the more money they make. The easier the light bulb is to repair, the more money they make. The easier it is to take the light bulb and disassemble it and refurbish it or remanufacture it or recycle it in some way into future light bulbs, the more money they make. And so oftentimes in sustainability, there's a lot of conversations about how, you know, the only way to save the world is to get rid of Milton Friedman, right? That his definition, business of business of business, that's what's broken. It's a lack of responsibility. And I can entertain those arguments and they're interesting, but they're kind of like angels on the head of a pin, right? They're philosophical in nature. The Phillips example gives us some evidence that sustainability can be profit, right? As Wei Yan said correctly in the chat, right? That like you have to just create the right set of incentives, right? Sustainability can make you money. It doesn't have to be antagonistic to making you money. And so that's like one of the most important things, the most important reframe that we like to bring to the table when we talk about sustainability. Stop thinking about it as a source of cost. Start, stop thinking about it as like, oh, it's a good thing to do and I'm going to be a moral and ethical person. It's like sustainability can make you beat your competition, gain market share, grow, right? It's a different conversation. So excellent, excellent examples. Now, there's a lot of things that are motivating the business world to be a little more sustainable, right? One of them is uh, society, right? Consumers are always asking businesses to be more sustainable. They're saying, look, we, we prefer to buy a more sustainable product. If you give me the choice between a sustainable cookie and an unsustainable cookie, I will pick the sustainable one, right? Shout out to Sustainable. Uh, uh, but we also look for, you know, we also nudge companies with, uh, environmental campaigns, right? We make sure that uh, if, we, if a company is behaving irresponsibly, uh, we'll go after them, right? We, we will chain ourselves to a tree or to a factory fence or whatever it might be and, and force a company to behave more responsibly, right? And Yvonne is pointing out something really important in the chat is that, yeah, there's social drivers of sustainability. And then there's this huge range of governmental drivers as well, 
right? There's governments forcing behavior. There's governments, it's, Ivan is my plant, apparently, who comes up with all the ideas that I need in order to segue to my next line. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, forcing behavior, uh, changing incentives, correcting a lack of information, right? So yeah, you can, you can create tax incentives or tax breaks. You can uh, ban you know, CFCs, which are contributing to the degradation of the o o ozone layer. You can provide tax reform that says, hey, let's make sure that we're equitably treating renewable and fossil fuel energy the same way. But you can also just do things like awards and recognition, being like, here's a fantastic product. Let's give it a gold star, right? That's the best fridge you could ever buy. Right? So lots of social drivers, lots of governmental drivers. But Jing is my other plan because they identified ESG, environmental, social, and governance behavior is a major driver of sustainability. Right? So here's Larry Fink. And he's a bit of a, a divisive figure. Um, some folks say he's a hypocrite. Right? Some folks say he's an ESG leader. All I know is Larry's rich, really, really rich. Right, Larry at BlackRock controls a ten trillion dollar investment fund. Right, that's like twice the size of Canada's economy. Right, this is a big deal. And every year, Larry writes a letter to all of the CEOs of the companies that he's an investor in. And look, Larry is the largest uh, investor in most companies that are publicly listed. Right, between BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, these three big institutional investors, those three companies built, combined are typically the largest shareholders in almost every publicly listed company. It's remarkable, right? And he thinks that this culture of quarterly earnings hysteria is contrary to long-term approach we need. We're asking for every CEO to lay out a shareholder uh, framework for shareholders to sort of have long-term value creation. Right. And so this is a huge motivator for businesses now to increasingly understand uh, and, and apply ESG thinking, because as Sarah uh, correctly identifies to, in the chat to the hosts and panelists, not to everyone, Sarah, you got to send it to everyone if you want to see other folks seeing your comments, is that, look, in some industries like resource extraction, right, you have this social license, like you have to be good. The business of business is no longer just business. Sorry, Mr. Friedman. Right? That idea hit its logical extreme, and now new ideas have emerged to the fore. And sustainability is seen as a central tool for discovering risk. So Mr. Fink goes around the world and knocks on people's doors and says, look, what are you up to? Right? Tell me about your climate change policy. Tell me what you're doing with water. Tell me what your impacts on deforestation are. Tell me uh, from a social side. Right? Uh, what's going on with gender and diversity? Tell me what's going on with your labor standards or your community relations. And from a governance perspective, who's on your board? Do you have any women on your board? You don't? That's a problem, right? Why are there no women on your board? What, what, what's your executive compensation strategy? What's your CEO making versus your frontline employees? Is it 100 times more money or 10 times more money? So why does Mr. Fink care about these things? Well, because as an investor, he's, he's very interested in returns. Yes, he wants to make money. He's also very interested in risk. And one of the best ways that investors have discovered for identifying risk is non-financial performance, right? They're very interested in all the non-financial behaviors of a company because they think it's an excellent proxy for the responsibility and the competence of the management team. And so now suddenly to be in business is to have an understanding of what's going on with climate, to have an understanding of what's going on around uh, racial equity, to have an understanding of what's going on with workers in your supply chain. You're required to have that now. And what's remarkable is that ESG is this emergent investment category that is growing very, very quickly. Now, Europe and the United States are uh, obviously the big, big drivers here. But increasingly, you're seeing Canada started to pick up some slack and, and, and Japan as well. And we are on a pathway towards $53 trillion of assets under management, that's AUM, being managed against some kind of ESG criteria by 2025, right? This is the fastest growing investment thesis in the world. It's not digitization. It's not localization. It's ESG. And look, there's a lot of signal, but there's also a lot of noise. I'm not here to say that this is perfect, that suddenly the bankers are going to save the world. That's a risky bet. I am not relying on the bankers to save a world, but I no longer believe that they're fundamentally opposed to the well-being of others, that they have recognized that extending their definition of business is good for business. 
right? Paul Pullman was a former CEO of Unilever, and he said very accurately that you cannot have a stable business without a stable society. And so if businesses are contributing to instability in society, that's a problem, right? So let's resolve that. So we can think about sustainability in lots of different ways. It's a, it's a, a definition and a concept that plays out in all sorts of interesting arenas, right? For many folks, sustainability is about efficiency, right? So it's about like thinking about how do I get the widgets off that factory line as quickly and as effectively as possible. And I'm not going to think about whether it's the right inputs into the factory. I'm not going to think about the impact on the local environment. I'm not going to think about whether I'm making the right widget, but I'm going to make that widget as efficiently as possible with the least amount of waste and the least amount of energy, right? That's a very tempting definition of sustainability, but you start sort of extending your thinking the, in the scale of analysis that you're bringing to the table. You start broadening the time horizon, expanding the spatial scale, and you start having additional layers of sustainability that you could pursue, right? So for example, at Costco, which is a big retailer in the United States, the milk jugs are shaped funny, right? They're square. Why are the milk jugs square? Well, because they can stack on top of each other. So when you go, when you put the milk jugs on a truck, you can, instead of having to have a plastic crate to fill the milk jugs in, you don't need the plastic crate. You just have pallets of milk jugs. And so you can get 20% more milk jugs on a truck by changing the shape of the jug. Is this saving the world? It is not. It's not saving the world. Is it making Costco a more efficient and therefore more sustainable company? Sure, right? It's, 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 it's engineering and design choice. But let's look at laundry detergent, right? Here's a company called Seventh Generation. And they realize that laundry detergent can be much more intense, right? That most laundry detergent you buy is water, right? It's just water when you buy a big jug of Tide. So you buy Seventh Generation. It's very dense. It's like a condensed, intense formula. The other thing that they realized was that the container has all sorts of competing purposes. Like... You need the plastic to hold the detergent in place. It needs to be impermeable, like waterproof. But you don't need the plastic to provide the structure to the container. So the structure can instead come from, let's say, the cardboard, right? An exterior lining. And when you want to recycle the container, you can pull the cardboard off, recycle the cardboard, take the plastic liner, put it in the recycling bin, right? Now, plastic recycling is problematic for all sorts of reasons that we're not going to explore. But nonetheless, like this is a company going beyond like, how can we just fit more laundry detergent on a truck towards like, how should we fundamentally rethink laundry detergent to be more responsible and therefore more sustainable? But then you can expand your scale even more. Uh, a while ago, I think about 10 years ago, the, I, the Nike Flyknit was a very stylish sneaker, right? Everyone had Flyknits. And sort of the, the, the untold story of the Nike Flyknit is that it was the result of a sustainability design challenge where engineers at Nike were asked, what should we do with all the waste on the factory floor? Where should this go? And it turns out that one of the things you could do with the waste from a factory floor is you grind it up into little bits and then you, you reconstitute those little bits into, a, into a, you know, essentially a vat. And then from that vat, you extract a long skinny thread. And then that thread becomes like a woven fabric, and then that woven fabric becomes a shoe, right? I've turned my waste product into a shoe, right? It's not mind-blowing, but it's like we turned a source of waste that was literally prior to this shoe going direct to market, direct to the landfill, and instead we turned it into a shoe. And then everyone started copying Nike. And then suddenly this sort of mesh-like, sock-like sneaker became popular everywhere, and everyone had mesh-like sneakers, right? Changed the footwear game forever. And here's a company who's, who's, who's wanting to, um, here's a company who's wanting to sell you shoes forever, right? Nike wants you to like to buy Nikes all the time. And they know that you as an affluent consumer have a lot of choices in the footwear game. You can go to, you can go to Vessi or Adidas or Puma or some emergent footwear brand that maybe is making their shoes out of like ocean plastic or grape leaves or pineapple, right? These are literally companies making shoes out of grape leaves right now right? And Nike needs to buy your social license. And they need to assuage you of your guilt by making a more sustainable sneaker. But then you have sort of the longest of timescales, right? Companies like Shell. So Shell is a company that is in the energy business. 
for a while they were in the oil and gas business, and then they were in the gas and oil business. But now Shell is looking at the energy sector and saying, you know what business we don't want to be in? The oil business. We want to we want to be you know just providing energy products, whether that's energy storage, energy transmission, whether that's renewable energies, whether that's smart energy, whether that's like whatever it is, hydrogen. We want to be in the energy business. We will creatively destroy ourselves. We were in. We will invest in our demise because that's the only way to be sustainable and to thrive, right? And so that's kind of where we see companies go. Expanding scales of strategic opportunity from the milk jug to the laundry detergent, to the shoe, to reimagining your fundamental purpose. All of these things inspired by sustainability. And so if there's two things that you remember from our time together this afternoon, it's that sustainability should never be seen as like a cost center, right? It's a driver of growth. Right? Sustainability is, is a way to discover risk. Right? Sometimes you have to be more sustainable. Right? Regulatory management or reputational management. Sometimes from a risk management perspective, there's operational risk you need to take into consideration. But then there's also sustainability as a way to make your operations more sustainable or your value chain, like your supply chain, your vendors and contracts, just make them more sustainable. There's a way to use sustainability to tell a better story about who you are and drive green sales and marketing. All of these things improve your returns on capital. But the most interesting opportunities in sustainability are in and around new markets, are the new products that don't exist, that sustainability, sort of sustainable grounded thinking, the design thinking, the systems thinking it represents, allows you to imagine things into existence. Can you create new products? Or can you reimagine your business portfolio, just like Shell is doing, or as Kareem correctly identifies in chat, like Phillips Morris is doing, where it's saying, we're a tobacco company and we're getting out of the cigarette business. That's the only way for us to survive, right? Is to creatively destroy ourselves. The other idea that we need to sort of combat is that sustainability is you know, something that's just gonna cost us money. If you have a stronger brand like Nike, because you've invested a lot in marketing, but also invested a lot in sustainability, you're gonna sell those shoes for more money, right? The stronger your brand, the more you can charge. If you have figured out how to make your factories very efficient, you've reduced your tax burden, you've made your supply chain more efficient, you're going to have reduced costs. If you found a way to be a company that people want to work for, that you can attract and retain and motivate your employees, you're going to have reduced employee turnover. Pricing power, cost savings, and employee recruitment and engagement, that's profit. That's pure profit. If you think about improved customer loyalty, right? If, if, if people stay with you, or in fact, more people move to you because you have found a way to be a more sustainable company, you're going to maintain or increase your market share. If you are going to use sustainability as a lens to discover new markets or products, you're going to enter entirely new markets. That's revenue growth. And then from a financial perspective, there's like a risk element and a cost of capital. So Larry Fink, the ESG investor is going to be more likely to give you money if you're a well-managed, sustainable company. And the more people who want to give you money as an investor, the lower your cost of capital, right? The less interest you pay, right? That's good for business. Similarly, if you're a company that's doing an excellent job understanding sustainability and the impacts on your operations, insurance companies are going to look at you and be like, you're a better company to insure. And so if you have lower risks and a lower cost of capital, your company is overall more valuable to investors. So again, sustainability drives shareholder return. It's not incompatible with Friedman. It just adds another layer to what Friedman is talking about. Now, one of the things that, that happened more recently was that we, we, you may recall, there was a pandemic. And prior to that pandemic, sustainability was, um, was something of a niche issue at times, right? A business, as long as it made money, as long as it was profitable, that's all that needed to happen. But if you had a little attention or particularly aggressive you know, employee or some investor who really wanted you behave differently, yeah, you might sprinkle a little bit of that money on people and planet, but as long as you were making money, you were good. And folks like myself who are concerned with sustainability were saying, hey, look, can we, can we take these things into equal consideration, like a three-legged stool, like a triple bottom line? But COVID taught us, and, and, you know, and the climate crisis is telling us, look, your profit system, like how you make money, is a subset of what society tolerates, right? So if society cannot tolerate 
the office or the restaurant or a, or a movie theater because there's a disease going around and people are dying, right? Your business has to adapt, right? You are, your business is a function of what society will tolerate. And what society will tolerate is oftentimes a function of what our planet is signaling to us. And so the virus is just like one example of a planetary signal. But there's all sorts of examples that might come down our road, right? Whether it's extreme heat or extreme drought or extreme weather of all sorts of kinds, which make food more expensive. And as a result, we're like, oh my God, our systems are no longer sustainable. We have to adapt. Our political preferences change. The geopolitical environment changes. And that in turn constrains the opportunities of business. Right. And so, again, this is an interesting, like philosophical way to think about sort of the ordering between people, planet and profit. But the reason why the middle definition is so popular and still taught to this day is that it gives you a bias to action. Right. That you say, I'm going to proceed with a decision or I'm not going to proceed based on whether it satisfies a profit imperative, a planetary imperative and a people based imperative. Now, let's go back to space and time for a moment. Seeger introduced the idea to us. We explored it from efficiency, responsibility, resilience, and creativity. But we could also think about you know, these, these act actors, people, planet, profit, or environment, economy, society, as, as sitting in different places on this space-time framework. Right? The environment is huge, and its time frame is almost infinite. The economy is huge, not quite as huge as the environment, but it's huge nonetheless. But its time frame is quite short. And sometimes it feels like society is like, you know, very self-interested or self-obsessed and with an extremely short attention span. So maybe that's why creating alignment or creating a triple bottom line between these three ideas is impossible if, you know, if not just very difficult. But there's also a fallacy in this representation too. Because the reality is that the economy is diverse, right? There are day traders who are trying to make as much money over the course of a few minutes or a few hours. And there are ESG investors like Larry Fink trying to make money over 10 or 20 or 30 years. In society, you have poor people who are just trying to put food on their table, but you also have educated elites who are really concerned with long-term sustainability. And similarly, if you're from an environmental lens, if all you're ever trying to do is save the planet, you are going to be constantly frustrated. But if you've found a species or a habitat or a specific environmental issue that you can address, maybe you have some success. And so never think of sustainability or a company as, as, as heterogeneous, like a CFO and a CEO might have a totally different definition. An employee trying to make it through an eight-hour shift might have a different definition than a regional manager or a vice president. They might all be positioning themselves in different places. From a political perspective, a president might be consumed with winning the 24-hour news cycle or getting as much popular attention as possible. But a mayor thinks about politics and, and their job in a very different way. A mayor is very patient, right? Because they li live with the consequences of rising sea levels or the garbage not working or the sewers being backed up. But nobody thinks about, hey, what did your mayor do yesterday? Right? We all know what our president or prime minister did. None of us know what the mayor did. Right? And then again, from an environmental perspective, look, sometimes the mouse just makes it through the night right? It's got an individual survival strategy. And then you sort of work your way up in the scale of analysis. So I want to give you some examples of things that might be sustainable. Let's say there's some industrial land on the outskirts of Vancouver. And that land used to be habitat for migratory birds, but then it was a huge sawmill. And now it's not a nice place to go. So some property developer goes to the local mayor and says, I will redevelop that land into an office complex with a green roof and that green roof will provide habitat for the migratory birds. My economic, my investment will provide for offices and you just need to rezone the land to allow me to do this. Is this saving the world? Maybe not. Is it sustainable? Yes, right? You're finding a way to improve something to make the future better than the present. On the other hand, you could go to some totally logical extreme. Let's say you're like Elon Musk. And you are consumed with the idea that we should put a million people on Mars in his lifetime. And so he decides to start a company driven by that mission, interplanetary travel, because humanity should not be a single planet species, is Musk's stated goal. And through a certain lens, you know, I can appreciate where he's coming from. 
right? He's saying, look, humans are brilliant and intelligent and charismatic, and we have philosophy and art and culture and history. And if something were to be terrible happened to earth, what a waste it would be for that to all get lost. So we better spread out our risk between Mars and earth. And people went along with it. And so his sort of goal of protecting homo sapiens and our civilization attracted a lot of venture capitalists who were very interested in sort of this long-term, very risky bet. So what you're seeing here is, 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 is that sustainability is oftentimes like complex. It's, it's hard to figure out, like, how do I put it into context? How do I argue one side versus the other? How do I, how do I, how do I figure out what kind of a transition is underway? And so like a really easy question for you to understand is like, hey, what's more sustainable, the horse or the cart? Right? We're 100 years removed from the transition from the horse to the car. But I ask you, what's more sustainable? Right? Well, some folks will say the horse because it's biodegradable. Right? What do you do with a dead horse? You eat it. You make some leather, right? some violin strings, some fertilizer, whatever it might be. Right? What do you do with an old car? Well, that's a difficult environmental problem. How do I make horses? They self-replicate. Right? How do I fuel horses? They eat hay and apples. This is an amazing system of transportation, right? But it didn't scale, right? It created waste streams. It created side effects, things that people didn't anticipate. The car comes along and solves all of the environmental problems that the horse is creating, right? All of the manure on the streets. The car produces just a little bit of harmless gas, right? No big deal, right? Well, you take the car to its logical extreme, and suddenly we have billions of them around the world, and transportation is contributing to 30% of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis. Right? So clearly, you know, sustainability is a transition, because now we're asking what's more sustainable than the internal combustion engine. Well, it's the electric vehicle. Right? It's sustainability, we're always shifting. There's always new goalposts, new problems, new needs to be met, right? new technologies that emerge. And so I could have asked a better question than what's more sustainable, the horse or the car. I could have asked what's more sustainable for a five kilometer trip. I could have asked you what's more sustainable as a system of transportation, right? In all of this, the framing is of vital importance. Like how are you thinking about the choices in front of you? And so another definition of sustainability that allows us to put it in context is to think about one moving from one product process or system to another in a way that makes things better. Right, So as I move from the horse to the car, I solve the set of problems. And as I move from one kind of car to another set of kind of car, I'll solve a new set of problems. As we move from fossil fuels to renewable energy, we're going to introduce a new set of problems. And as we solve those issues of batteries or windmills or hydrogen production, whatever it might be, we're then going to move to a new set of problems and it'll be endless. Right? Sustainability is a process, not a destination. Right? It's absolutely endless. I mean, think about like a classic sustainability choice, like uh, how, what's a more sustainable way of making a coffee pot, the coffee, like, do I use a pod or, or a, a coffee cup, a big carafe, like a traditional brewing system, right? Do I make a single dose or do I make eight cups? Most people think that the single dose coffee cup is very bad, right? Because it goes into the garbage after, right? And so that's very unsustainable because you can experience and feel that waste. And they would prefer making eight cups of coffee. Well, what happens if you only drink 20% of that coffee? Is it still sustainable, right? Is this still the right thing to do for the environment, right? What if I drink an espresso pod versus a Starbucks coffee? Which of those is more sustainable? And again, we could try and argue about the aluminum content of the Nespresso pod versus the paper and wax content of the Starbucks cup and figure out like the, you know, the life cycle impacts of all these various things. And we could, we could bring in the engineers, but they're not going to solve it. The engineers can't help. Right, because what we actually need to do is think about sort of the long-term implications of this. Like, well, what about the the land use or the water or the roasting of the coffee or the energy requirements, the human requirements, the human rights implications of the coffee production, the distribution of the coffee itself? So there's way more than simply this sort of surface level comparison of coffee pod, coffee cup, coffee pod, coffee carafe. It's a different game, right? So in English, we like to say like good comparisons are comparisons that are apples to apples and, and bad comparisons are comparisons that are apples to oranges. But like, here's a hard comparison, an apple to an apple. And you might be like, well, that's ridiculous, Justin. Like, why would I make such a comparison? Okay, fine. Let's compare an iMac to an iPhone. Well, that's, that's, that's difficult too. Well, an iPhone replaces your calculator address book, your video camera, your gaming system. You have to compare those things, right? 
you have to compare your iPhone to the newspaper, the magazine, the radio, or television, all of those things that represent, like you have no choice, right? And so what I want to end with here is this idea of transitions, right? Because sustainability is clearly not just a philosophical idea. It's not just a source of innovation. It's also a transition. And oftentimes we get upset when these transitions don't play out in the way we want, right? Most of us like to think that industrial transitions look like this, that a new light bulb comes along and it replaces the old light bulb and that's it, right? The system to support the technology is pre-existing, the, the sockets and the wiring and the switches. And all I have to do is take out the old incandescent light bulb and insert the new LED light bulb and I'm in a excellent position, right? We like to think of sustainability unfolding like that. But sometimes there's like an illusion of resilience. For example, the first high definition televisions, HD TVs, were made in the 1980s. The problem was there was no content. There was no Blu-rays. There was no high definition cable or satellite. And so you had these very high density pixel screens that were very expensive with nothing to put on them. And so it wasn't until the system to support the new technology emerged that then the new technology took off. And so the, the, it was delayed, right? And so even though it had better performance, adoption was delayed because the system to support the new technology never emerged. We have examples where the system to support a new technology might be here, but the existing technology continues to improve. Think about the transition from the internal combustion engine to the electric vehicle, right? It's pretty easy right now to get an EV and it's pretty easy to get an internal combustion engine. But if you look at the last five years of internal combustion engines, the cars keep getting better. They get more efficient, they get fancier, they have more gadgets, they have more widget, wizardry, they have blind spot detection, automatic braking, all these wonderful things that, they're, that they do. And this is delaying the adoption of the EV because it's getting easier and easier you know, to, to stick with your internal combustion engine. And so then you have this kind of notion of robust resilience, like let's say the adoption of a fully autonomous, collectively owned car network where you never actually even own a car. You just, you, 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 uh, you uh, sort of summon the car from an application on your phone and then it takes you from point A to point B and you never even touch the steering wheel, right? We would all love that. But there's all sorts of hurdles, not just technological, but societal, regulatory, financial. And so we're in this existence of like robust resilience where the old technology, the traditional car continues to improve and the system to support the new technology fails to emerge. And so you have to think about these transitions, not just like from an impatient lens, like why are we not building more sustainable buildings or eating more sustainable cookies or creating more sustainable transportation systems, right? And recognize that there's all sorts of factors at play that delay these transitions. And so the mother of all transitions is actually in front of all of you right now, climate change, right? This will be the most significant transition in your life, and certainly probably the most significant transition in the last 200 years, right? Climate and what it represents is kind of like taking the digital revolution and the industrial revolution and the agricultural revolution and smashing them all together and saying, you have 30 years to act. And there's all sorts of pathways that we're going to follow, right? If we don't do anything and we carry on our current pathway, we're going to end up in a scenario where we have all sorts of physical risk, Increased fires, increased flooding, increased droughts, increased prices for food, increased prices for travel, vacation, geopolitical conflict, incredible stress on humans, especially the most vulnerable. Or we're going to have a scenario of transitionary risk where things get left behind, where fossil fuels aren't valuable anymore, where parking lots are no longer required, where the idea of like a consumer driven economy no longer seems all that sensible as we transition to something more sustainable. And so around the world, you actually see a majority of the world's governments committing to action around this, right? This is a, a, a document from the International Energy Association report in August of 2021, where they looked at how many countries have pledged to net zero, that is having no carbon emissions, net zero carbon emissions by 2050, or in the case of China, 2060, or in the case of India, 2070. It is now the majority of global GDP has committed to net zero. A majority of CO2 emissions have committed to net zero. And this is, like I said, going to represent the most dramatic change in our economies and how companies function in decades, if not ever, right? We are not prepared truly for what's going to happen. But what can prepare you is an understanding of how to put sustainability in context, to understand what drives it, to understand the innovation opportunities, 
to understand the value creation opportunity, to understand the transitions underway. Because we are going down this pathway where human emissions are going to go from 34 gigatons a year right now across the power industry, buildings and transportation sector, down to zero gigatons in 2050. The changes required in every system that you interact with are dramatic. And I could not imagine a more exciting time to be in business because the status quo has never been less desirable, right? It never has existing value creation models been under more stress to change and evolve and be more sustainable. And it's a fantastic opportunity to figure out how you can contribute. So Mark Andreessen wrote an essay, a very famous essay in 2010, talking about how software is eating the world. And he was articulating his thesis that I would invest in companies like Airbnb or Uber, where I look at a sector of the economy, tourism or transportation, and I see low levels of digital technology penetration, right? Travel was not that digital. Hotels were not that digital. And so his company made truly tens of billions of dollars making big bets off of the thesis that everything is going to be digitized. Right? And they were very successful with this thesis. Well, there's a new generation of investors and they're looking at the global economy and they're asking themselves, how is this going to change because of climate? Their thesis is that climate is eating the world. And it's going to represent something as impactful and significant as what we've seen in the last 20 years with the internet. So I want to say thank you to you all for, for taking some time to just get a little bit of insight into our, how we talk about these issues at Sodder. And I would encourage you to stick around to ask any questions of the team here. Thank you very much. Thank you.